I've just returned from a trip to Europe. I attended a conference in Madrid, Spain, and there was over 50 pastors and uh, business leaders from around the world, or rep sorry, more than that, but representing 50 different countries. And it's really good to go catch up with them because it gives you a bit of a global picture on the church and how different it is in different locations around the world. Uh, in this particular conference, we actually had the Russian pastors praying with and for the Ukrainian pastors. And uh, yeah, give them a clap. Like that was, the, the, the church is the church. Wherever we go, it's the church. And uh, speaking to the, one of the Ukrainian pastors there, he said it was just a month back that he was at church on a Sunday morning, about 200 people in the, in the auditorium, and a Russian missile hit his church. Uh, he said it didn't detonate, nobody was hurt. It was just a miracle of God right there on a Sunday morning. <clears throat> to speaking to the pastor from Algeria where it's illegal to be a Christian. And uh, he was saying, how many Muslims are becoming Christians because Jesus is appearing to them in dreams and in visions? Uh, just supernatural. You know, it reminds me of the days of Paul. Isn't that what happened to Paul? He had a vision of Jesus on the way, and that's how he got saved. Well, that's happening right now in Algeria, uh, where Muslims are, are Jesus appearing to them, they're converting, and they can't advertise where they're going to meet in home groups. They have to hear the Holy Spirit to tell them where to go on a Wednesday night uh, to get there. That's how they find out. It's all just miraculous. And, um, and then speaking to the um, pastor from Egypt, he's got a big church in Cairo. He said he has a... Well, let me, let me explain how it, in Egypt, when you were born, you were giving, given an ID card. And on your ID card, it's either Christian or Muslim. And you can't, if you're a, uh, a, a Christian, you can convert to Islam, but in Egypt, you can't convert from Islam to Christianity. So you've got your ID card, which means that's why you do your banking, go to school. So that's your card to do life there. He said he has over a thousand young people that have now converted from Islam to Christianity. Um, the dilemma with that is, is that they can't change their ID card. So on their ID card, it still says Muslim. Um, and in Egypt, it's illegal for Muslims to marry Christians. Therefore, a thousand young people now becoming Christian can never get married for the rest of their lives. So their card still says Islam. So a thousand people have said, you know what? We're prepared to not be married because we want to serve Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Now, it's what, what the different places in the world that they, they, they've decided, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm a believer and it means not getting married, so be it. And uh, so we, we, we sometimes miss how powerful the world that we live in right here in Australia uh, with the freedoms that we have. And, um, and uh, then you go to the other extreme where in South America, in Brazil, the average church is 20,000 people. Um, it is such a move of God there. The person I was speaking to has 60,000 people in his church right there. But he says the average side is just huge, 20,000 people. He said right now, evangelicals are as many evangelicals in Brazil as our Catholics. That's half the population is now evangelical. So it's just a move of God right through South America. And... Uh, and again, I, I find it fascinating when I go and listen to these people from different parts of the world, different stories from manifestations of Jesus and dreams to missiles being dropped on your church uh, to the body of Christ right around the world, no matter what race, what color, what culture, we're standing together, worshiping God together, for we are the church of Jesus Christ globally. And it's a very, very real thing. God is moving on our earth. God is moving on our earth. And I'm listening going, I want a 20,000 member church in Brisbane. What about, why don't we have some 20,000 member churches here? And why not? God's done them there. He can do them somewhere else as well. So we're on this theme at the moment called the gospel. And we've got Easter coming up next week. And, you know, the death and the resurrection of Jesus is the most significant event in human history. Nothing has changed the world like the death of Jesus. And we're going to celebrate that next week. So don't miss that. Good Friday. And... Understand on Sunday, it's a 9 a.m. service, all right? So if you all come when you usually come at 10.30, quarter to 11, <laughs> you'll have missed the service, all right? I know it says 10.15, but I know when you all come. Um, so be here at 9 o'clock. It will be busy, so make sure you get here early and get a seat. So going along that theme of the gospel, I'm going to speak to you this morning about living saved, 
and called. Saved and called. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8 and 9 says this. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. This is Paul speaking. This is the last letter Paul actually writes while he's in jail. It's the last writing to Timothy that he actually does before he's executed. Um, And he said, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us. He has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. We are saved and then called. He he did mention there, it's not in our own works, and today is our water baptism day, but it's also our baptism of the Holy Spirit today. See, to be a strong believer is not about trying harder, it's about drawing closer. And what we need is an infilling of the Holy Spirit. The Bible speaks very clearly about that. Jesus said it. Man, wait till the, you, know, you get empowered by the Holy Spirit. And I, I know of no greater thing in my life to outwork what God's coming to do than the infilling of the Holy Spirit. So straight after the service today, down here, we're going to be praying for people to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And it, maybe if you're feeling dry and you just need to be filled up again, come on down. For this is the entity that will help you outwork what we're talking about today. All right. We are saved and then called. You know, before knowing Jesus, and I didn't grow up in church, and uh, I wasn't a believer until I was 24, uh, before knowing His love, uh, His saving grace, His power, uh, my future looked pretty empty. I was successful in business, that wasn't the issue. But I had a life without purpose or meaning, like why do we exist? Where's it all going? I had no context of the reason planet Earth existed at all or why we lived here. It, wasn't just, it had to be more than just wait, working up, going to work, doing the whole thing over and over again till the day we died. Then it was a context of an eternity without God. So we live this life, whatever this is, and then at the end, we all just fall down and turn to dust. Is that all there is? So a life without God has got its own particular challenges. So when we find Him, we find out there's a God that cares, It's about His love, and He has a purpose, a reason for me being here. He's thought about me. He knows me. He's given me an idea of a future and a reason for my future. And He's promised me an eternity with Him. You know, know, when we've been there 10,000 years, there's a context in God that salvation takes us out of our past, into our future, and into our eternity. It's our new life being saved. It's our future. It's our salvation. Uh, which is important, and it, and it should be really important to every one of us that God found us. We are saved. Not just saved out of something, but saved into something as well. Saved out of our past, but saved into the kingdom of God. We become sons, daughters of the Most High God. But when we get saved, it's not the end, it's just the beginning. Um, once we are, once we've settled that we're going to heaven, And you've got to get this settled. If you're a believer, when you die, you go to heaven. There's no option. Dead believers go to heaven. So then once you've got that settled that you're a believer, a follower in Christ, then the goal of my faith now is not to get to heaven because that's assured. That's my result. It changes now from not me getting to heaven. It's now about me getting heaven to earth. And that's why God keeps us on the planet to get us from heaven. To, de- to get us to reach out to other people. He actually said, pray like this, my kingdom come, my will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The reason we are here today is to bring heaven to earth. And the more of heaven we bring to earth, the more of earth we're gonna see go to heaven. That's the plan of God. And I don't wanna upset too many people here today, but everything in God's not just about you. It's not just about me. We are blessed so we can be a blessing. We are healed so we can bring healing. We're even saved so we can bring salvation. Jesus did not say, go into all the world. His last words, think about this. We just read Paul's last words, the second Timothy there. Jesus' last words were, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. The last thing he says, he could have spoke on anything. 
prayer. I mean, he said, no, go into all the world and make decisions. And he did not say make decisions. He said make disciples. It starts with a decision, no doubt about that. That's saved. But a part of our journey, we read it, it's not just saved, it's saved and called. And we're called to be disciples. Disciples help other people get to heaven. That's why we exist. That's why the church is here. We are saved and then we are called, not just to make it to heaven. Plan, part one, God's plan is for all people to find and accept Jesus as their Lord and Saviour. It's about them. It's about people. Heaven becomes our eternal destination. This is what we call the gospel. This is the good news. Then God so loved the world, He didn't come to condemn the world or judge it, but that through Him we shall be saved. That's the good news. It's the gospel. Part one, we accept Jesus. We're saved. We're believers. Then part two is we're called with a holy calling. So God's plan is much bigger than just getting me to heaven just getting you to heaven. It's about me and you helping others get to heaven as well. To see others healed, others set free. It's not, so it's wrong thinking as a believer to think, now that I'm a believer, it's okay to go to church once a month. It's not okay, it's not gospel. I know, I know we're away certain things, I know things happen, but there's gotta be a context that if we're to be a believer, it's beyond just being saved and we're gonna make it to heaven. Pray, I, I, I pray when I, I've got a need or when hell breaks loose. No, we're called to more than praying just when we need God to save us. Yeah. We're called into relationship with Him. Yeah. The Bible, well, I, 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 the Scriptures are on Sunday morning on the screens. So I've got my Bible. I don't have to be involved. I, I'm just gonna hang out till I pass on. I'm just gonna, you know, do enough good things to keep the universal scales of justice balanced so I can slip my way into heaven at the end of my days. No, no, no. God's plan for you and me is much bigger than to survive to the end to go to heaven. Yes. We are saved and then we are called with a holy calling. You were designed for a purpose. You have a reason to be on the earth right now. You are, and it is beyond yourself, it is for others. It's not about existing till the end comes. It's finding what God wants us to do and moving in that direction. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we, this is my favorite scripture in the Bible. It says so many things. Firstly, we are His workmanship. You're not an accident here. You are designed by God. On the back of your soul, there's a tag, and it doesn't say made in China or Taiwan or India. It says made in heaven. We are His workmanship. You have been created and designed for a reason to live in this time in history, to make a difference to this generation. Created in Christ Jesus for, it does not say evil. Mankind was never created for evil works. He was created for good works. It also doesn't say He was not created for no works. It doesn't say, you know, you're created for nothing. You were created for nothing, just hang around, you know, just yeah, hang. No, for good works, which God prepared beforehand them, that what? You should walk in them. We are saved and then we are called. We're saved, the decision's made. We're called to be disciples to help the rest of the world find out about the wonder of Jesus Christ. We're called, good works. Good works. The Christian life is about being saved and called. Let me, I want you to hear this this morning. You will not regret in heaven one moment of what you did on earth for the sake of the kingdom. You will not regret in heaven one moment of what you did on earth for the sake of the kingdom. We are here to bring healing to the sick, freedom to the bound and addicted, salvation to the lost, hope to the hopeless. This is our holy calling. Uh, and as I listen to what's going on in South America, I don't wanna just hear and read about the great things God's doing around the earth. I wanna be right in the middle of what God's doing. 
I want to see God move in this city, in this nation. As much as I enjoy their testimonies and get encouraged by it, I'm saying, God, we need something to break open in Brisbane, in Australia. And I think something is happening. 2024 has opened up something in the dynamics of the spirit world that has opened the gospel up. I wanna tell you, Brisbane is more ready to hear about Jesus than they were four years ago. Something has moved, something has shifted. They're telling me that statistically, enrollments to state schools have declined as people, not Christians, as people have decided to spend extra money and put their children in faith-based schools. Why? Because they don't like the wokeness and the things they're teaching them at state schools. And, and if Christian education, if it wasn't as expensive as it is, there'd be a lot more doing it. So it tells you something's moving in our society. Something's shifting, they're going, enough is enough. We don't want this way. I wanna tell you, we are open for something quite dramatic this year as the church in Brisbane. All the churches, we are ready. It's our holy calling to find someone, to tell someone, to pray for someone, to invite someone, to help someone. And no, we can't do everything, but we can do something. And that's something we must do. We must individually and corporately play our part in the plans of God in the generation we live in. And don't think that numbers are not important to God. Oh, oh, he, wrote, he wrote a whole book and called it Numbers. As a matter of fact, if you can't sleep and you want help, read the book of Numbers. <laughs> late at night. Read the book of Numbers late at night. Put you straight to sleep. And the New Testament, the Bible actually says that God's dream and plan is that all should be saved. And the word all in the Greek actually means all. And in Australian, it means a really big number. So God's dream is that numbers are important because it fills heaven and it empties hell. Don't think that, that numbers are not important to God. They are so important. For example, if, you've, if you had three small children and you're at the beach and you're talking to your wife and as you looked up, the children had scattered, all right? So you, you look at, we better go find them. Uh, the husband races this way, the wife races that way. The husband finds one of the children, brings him back and ties him up to the bumper bar of the car. The wife finds the other one, brings them back, and the husband says, oh, this is great. Let's go home. Can you imagine the, the look of your wife? She'd look at you, what are you talking about? We have three children. Two are found and one is lost. What if he just said, you know what? Numbers don't matter. Who knows numbers always matter to the one who's still lost? matters to the one who's still lost. And while we have lost people in our city and our nation, we can't sit down and pretend everything's all right. And I want you to get this said. We are no more civilized now with all our science than we were 6,000 years ago. We still go to war. We still hate each other because of the color of our skin. We still can't trust people because they lie all of the time. You know, we're, we're, <laughs> we're developing AI now. <laughs> and, and as much as that's a wonderful idea, humankind can't but help corrupt it. And it will be used for evil. And all of a sudden, all the good intention, it doesn't matter how good our intention we have, we are a broken race of people. Without Jesus, there is no hope. It doesn't matter how smart we get, He's the only hope of the world. It's where you take Jesus out of civilization, it falls into corruption, it has forever and ever. Jesus is the light of the world. And our job is to bring Jesus to the generation that we live in. Find someone, tell someone, pray for someone, invite someone, help someone. God is wanting to build His church. And I'm not talking about a building, I'm talking about a people. And he wants to fill it with heaven. 
It's not about bricks and mortar and stone. This is, this is not the church. We only have this so we don't get wet from when you hear me preach. We only have this so you can actually come on a hot sunny day and not die and fry. It's the only reason we have buildings. God's not building the church. He's building the church, which is His people. Not out of stone and brick and mortar, but out of heart, flesh and soul. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19 through 22. Now, now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. And this household has been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building, again, it's not brick and mortar, he's talking about people, the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. He's causing the church to be fitted together that we can be a holy temple housing the love and the power of the Holy Spirit and then releasing it to the generation we live in. We are the answer, or He is the answer to humankind's condition and problems. You know, in the Old Testament, they weren't ready in their faith to have God live in them and they couldn't grasp the concept of God in us. So what did they do? They, they originally built a box and called it the Ark of the Covenant and uh, carried it around on their shoulders and, and then they realised God was bigger than the box so they built a massive temple and uh, this was gonna be the house and place of the presence of God. But again, they couldn't grasp the God in us concept. They, they built a huge curtain and put God right down the end of the temple and again, no one had the faith or the ability to believe so they couldn't go in there and meet with God. All right, so now we've got, them. again, there's no context, but the day that Jesus dies on a cross at Calvary, when he dies, God had decided to move. The whole thing, Jesus said, it is finished. And that means it's so many different things were finished. But one of the things that was finished was he's not gonna live in a box. He's not gonna live in a temple. He's gonna live in his people like he always intended to do. And as he died, that temple curtain 10 kilometers away started to rip from top to bottom. And God says, I'm not living by myself anymore. I'm living in my people. And we are the people he has chosen to live in. We are the temple of the Holy Ghost. I'm moving, God said. And he ripped that temple curtain he said, from now on, I'm living in what I'd always designed to live in, my creation. You know, the only thing big enough to hold the presence of God is the heart of a human being. Isn't that amazing? The only thing big enough to hold the presence of God is the heart of a human being, a soul of his creation. 1 Peter chapter 2. Coming to him as a living stone, this is Jesus, Rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. Now listen to this. You also, as living stones, are being built up in a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. As I read this, I get the picture that, that God is wanting to build this church, this not building, but these people. You are a living stone to be fitted together, forming the kingdom of God on earth. A place for His presence, a place for His power, a place for His love, His church. So our choice, we are saved, but now it's our choice to be called. So our choice is to either become a living stone or a dead rock, a living stone or a dead rock. Here, the urge is, hey, become a living stone. You see, dead rocks aren't interested in being formed or fashioned by God. Dead rocks are only interested in what they want, how they feel. Not interested in helping anybody in particular. I mean, giving, serving, 
It's just about what I need right now. They're around. Dead rocks are around, but they don't carry responsibility for anything or anybody. They often question the Word of God rather than just obey it. I decided a long time when I became a believer that my obligation, if I want to see the power of God in my life, is not to question what the Word of God says, but to obey what the Word of God says. Because greater is He that is in me than he that is in the world. And His ways are not my ways. And I want to assure you, the God of your opinion has no power in the spirit world. Only the God of the Bible does. We're not to question it, we're to obey it. Dead rocks question the Word of God. They get confused about things. They don't get involved. They don't know the Word of God really. But to be a living stone, it's a whole different journey. Living stones embrace the heavenly angle grinder. They embrace it. They say, Lord, form and fashion me. Let the sparks fly. Do what you need to do in my life so I can again represent the Saviour of my life, Jesus. Do what you need to do in my life, Holy Spirit. I give you permission and right to do that. I wanna find my fit, my place in the temple. Bring the design that you've given me to the table, not for no works, not for evil works, but for good works. Because the truth is, if we're the temple of God as a people, there'll be stones on top, stones below, stones to the left, stones to the right, stuck in the middle with you. If I could sing, I would sing that. But I can't remember the tune. I should get Jess up there to sing it. No, (laughs) don't do that, she says. Stuck in the middle with you. We're the holy place of God. We're the temple of God. We are living stones being fitted together for His purposes. I want my life to count. I really do. I've been on the earth quite a while now and really there's nothing more to live for than than helping somebody else out, whether it be my family, my grandkids, the person that's sick, the person that's lost, the person that needs our help. There's no greater joy or purpose in making a difference in somebody else's life. I want my life to count. I want to make a difference. I am saved and I'm called. I will be His witness on the earth of the great Jesus who brought salvation to my life, my children, my grandchildren. I want you to hear the words of, an, um, again, of the freedom that we live in here. And I spoke to you about Egypt where you can't convert from Islam to Christianity legally. In Algeria, it's illegal to be a Christian. These are the words of an imprisoned Russian pastor at the end of the last century. From his jail, he was in jail at the time. And this was his plea to us in Western civilization. He said these words, don't give up in freedom what we will never give up in persecution. Don't take for granted where you live and give up And this is the words he said, don't give up in freedom what we would never give up in our persecution. That is our witness to the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Don't give it up. Don't lose sight of it. Don't don't feel pulled back because society's not tampering you right now. If society knew what they're doing, they would love Jesus. But they don't know what they're doing. We must bring the gospel to them. And like I said, there's something moving in Brisbane right now where there's more of a chance of people coming to church than we've seen for years and years. They watch too much news. And news brings fear, disappointment, disillusionment. It brings depression, it brings confusion. And now we live in a world that's blowing each other up, wars and rumours of wars, and Australia's spending on its military budget like we've never seen before. Why is that? And everybody out there is looking, what's going on? I wanna tell you, What the earth needs is Jesus Christ in our generation and the generations to come. He is the hope of the world. Don't give up in our freedom. What people like the Russian pastor would never give up in their persecution. He was in jail for being a pastor. Our witness to the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We have a great opportunity to bring Jesus to our generation. And everybody today, I, I don't know everybody here in this room, but you've heard me speak about Jesus here today and maybe you're not a believer yet. 
You can make a decision today that won't change something, it will change absolutely everything. The gospel, the good news is it doesn't matter what you've done, where you've been, God's not angry, He's not mad at you. He's always loved you, He wants you to live for Him and with Him. The Bible goes on to say, all you've gotta do, all I've gotta do is believe that Jesus died on a cross and rose again from the dead and I shall be saved. Saved out of my past, saved into a better future, saved into eternity. And right now, I'd love, you to give, I'd love to give you that opportunity. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes here. And in a moment, I wanna pray for people. In a moment, I'm gonna ask those who don't know Jesus to put up their hand. Or maybe those that have walked away from God and have decided, you know what, it's time to come back and recommit and reconnect. Or maybe it's just you've never made this decision. The day I walked into a church and made this decision, it changed everything about my life. I became a believer. God was on my side. And I don't know what you're facing right now. I don't know what challenges will be in your future. But I do know this, the answer you're gonna need in every one of those will start and finish in the name of Jesus. So with eyes closed, heads bowed, we say, you know what, Pastor Mark, pray with me today. I wanna believe upon Jesus. Will you lift your hand up, slip it up, give me a wave and say, you know what, thank you in the middle, that's a great decision there. Thank you at the back, that's a great decision there as well. So look from the front to the back, from the left to the right, looking one more time. I'm just gonna pray with you today. If this is you, say, you know what? I wanna believe today. I wanna know Jesus. I wanna commit to Him. One more time as I look, front to back, from left to right, looking, looking, looking. Thank you, sir, on that, on that side of the room. Lord, as I looked, I saw hands go up. It's not what you saw. You saw hearts open up and a miracle starts to happen. They start to come alive because they believe they start to come alive to God. And God, I know heaven rejoices when even one person comes home. So I know heaven rejoices for these ones. And so do we here at City Point. In Jesus' name, and all that agreed said, amen and amen. <laughs> After the conference in Spain, I went to our church in Bulgaria, Plovdiv, Bulgaria, City Point there. And we haven't been for a number of years, COVID and a whole bunch of things, um, but it is a booming church. Uh, there was over 300 people in the auditorium when I was there on Sunday. And uh, I would think that's probably the largest Pentecostal church in Bulgaria by, by a long way. And uh, Pastor Bojida has um, stepped out, he's, he's given the church over to his son, Simeon, and, his, and Simeon's wife, Anelia, they're the new pastors there, and they're doing such a great job. I think we've got a short video. I didn't play that yet, did I, in the service? Now, if we can play that, that would be great. There it is, City Point, Bulgaria. And uh, that beautiful LED screen you see in their church was paid for by you and me. And uh, we bought that for them and uh, they've painted their building black and they're starting to become City Point more and more. They've seen the fruit of that. And not only did our generosity help them design their building like that, uh, last year we uh, paid for a, a, a pastor's conference in the Ukraine during the war, where over 150 pastors and their wives got together to worship together and pray for their country during this terrible war. And again, it was the generosity of this church that enabled that to take place. And uh, what you see here is because of the greatness of the people in this house. And today, right now, we come again around that time where we can have a say here and around the world with the rescuing traffic girls out of Cambodia, saving a generation through Red Frogs, heading the Queensland University with the gospel at our St. Lucia campus to all the things that we do, comes around our ability to say, you know what, I have a holy calling. And my, part of my holy calling is to give unto God so great things can happen in the days that I live. An old song, que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be, or a bit more modern, akuna matata. 
don't worry, it'll, it'll all work out. They're all nice thoughts, but they're not exactly true. Most of life is not happenstance. The truth is, we create most of our future by what we do today. Whether our attitudes are right, the words we speak and the actions we do change the future either better or for worse. The question I ask us today is, are we creating the best future for yourself and for other people? The Bible would declare the best way to create the best future is to be a generous person. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9 and 10 says this, And let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season, that due season means in the future. If we don't grow weary in doing good, in the future we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those that are the household of the faith. Look after one another. In due season is talking about our future. We shall reap if we design it that way today. Don't grow weary in doing good. Give, love, be generous, believe, care. And you're setting yourself and others up for a great due season or a better, stronger future. Today, you can give many ways here. We've got containers going around. We've got QR codes in the back of seats. There is, a, uh, you can set it up online through your iPad, your iPhone. We've got giving stations at the back. But right now, let's get ready to be a part again of what God's doing here and around the world. Let's take that offering in our hand or in our heart if we're giving electronically. Let's pray. Father, we thank You right now. We come, we set the course of tomorrow by our giving today. God, we thank You that we're making a difference in Europe through Bulgaria. God, we're reaching gypsies by the hundreds over there right now for salvation. God, we thank You for all that we do around the world and what we do here in Brisbane. God, strengthen us. God, let us not grow weary in doing good. For in due season, we shall reap a great harvest for the kingdom if we do not lose heart. Bless these people. Bless this offering, I pray. Use it for Your glory. In Jesus' Name. And all that agreed said, Amen and Amen. Let's receive that great offering. Well, next week, we celebrate the greatest event in human history. Uh, this is the most emotional weekend for me of the year. I hardly cry any time during the year over anything except Easter. And every time I see Jesus portrayed on that cross up there, it just overwhelms me with the goodness of God that He found me and that He saved me. Why don't you invite somebody this weekend and say, you know what, why don't you come along and see what we believe and let it be touched by the presence and the glory of God. This is gonna be a great Easter. Let's look to the screens. Awesome. Well, Easter is this weekend, guys, and it does feel a bit funny, hey, because it's in March. It feels a little bit weird, but um, regardless, it's going to be a great weekend. Uh, like mentioned before, we have our Good Friday service this Friday at 9 a.m. It's going to be a quick hour communion service, and our, uh, our Sunday Easter celebration is going to be 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. So remember, no 10, 15, 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. next week. We've got a full kids program happening. We've got a gigantic Easter egg uh, hunt happening as well, which is going to be a lot of fun. So like Pastor Mark said, bring along your friends, family, loved ones along to next weekend. We're going to have a great time in the house celebrating the cross and the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, if you didn't also know, but today is Baptism Sunday, which means that we do have water baptisms taking place straight after the service outside, uh, which is going to be great. And then after the 5 p.m. as well tonight. And we also have Holy Spirit baptisms taking place just down here in this front section as well. So if you haven't been baptized, do it. If you have any questions, speak to any of the pastoral team down the front here as well, or the leadership team in the lounge. But uh, it is going to be a powerful time together. Um, other than that, that's all from me. So it'd be great if you guys could be up standing with me.
Come along outside. Let's celebrate those who are being baptized. And other than that, like Pastor Mark said, let's go out. Let's live our life boldly. Here, here we are chosen. Thank you. Thanks, team. baptisms and then we'll see you next weekend for Easter. See you there.